Good morning, everyone. I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, so I, I just wanted to, uh, first of all, uh, uh, just remind one quick reminder this, this week. We have our uh, um, annual holiday party uh, on Thursday. It starts at 4.30 to around 7.30 or 8. It'll be in the Greenberg Conference Center, which is a very nice facility uh, um, uh, towards Science Hill. And uh, we hope to see all of you there and uh, bring your laboratory partners and your colleagues. Um, and uh, uh, Reese and Anne have planned a, a really nice uh, program. Uh, we'll have a quartet from the School of Music, and we'll also have uh, some, uh, some music to dance to towards the end, um, and some good food. So with that introduction, I just want to uh, ask Nihar to introduce uh, Dr. Mark Sabatini, who is a world-renowned figure and someone who we're very fortunate to have uh, join us this morning. Thanks, Eric. Thanks, everyone. Uh, it's really an honor uh, for me to, to, to present, um, uh, introduce Mark uh, this morning. I can't get this to... So Mark was a um, born and raised in uh, New York City. We heard about many of those stories uh, last night with uh, him and Eric kind of trading uh, stories from their uh, from their youth, um, and then uh, left the bright lights of New York for for Cambridge and Boston, where he's been ever since, uh, completing his uh, undergraduate work, medical school, uh, residency um, at uh, Mass General, chief residency, cardiology fellowship, uh, the clinical component of that all at Mass General prior to moving to Brigham and Women's and the Timmy Study Group. And he's had a meteoric uh, rise there uh, and is now the uh, chairman of the Timmy Study Group, filling the very, uh, very, very large uh, shoes that were, uh, that were vacated there by, uh, by Dr. Bronwald, who of course is still involved, but Mark has taken over as the uh, study chair. Uh, he also holds the uh, Lewis Dexter uh, Chair in Cardiovascular Medicine and is a professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School. Uh, Mark has led a number of important clinical trials uh, of antithrombotics, novel diabetes agents, and of course, lipid-lowering therapy, which will be the focus of his talk um, today. I will say just on a personal note before uh, having him come up and, and share his presentation, um, I, I consider it you know, uh, incredibly good fortune on my part that I worked with him as a medical intern um, and then um, consider him a close uh, mentor and friend. And uh, in many ways, he inspired my career in, um, in clinical cardiology, and in patient-oriented investigation. And so um, I'm incredibly grateful um, for, to have Mark uh, visit us and, and, and honored um, to have him here at, at Yale. So Mark, please. Uh, thank you for that, that, that very kind introduction. It, it's really wonderful to be here. It was, uh, it was uh, a fabulous treat. I remember attending in our step-down service uh, to have Nihar as an intern. On the, on the step down uh, early in my, my tenure at the Brigham as an attending. Um, but so many different friends, Sam Hahn, who was an inspiration for why I wanted to do residency at MGH when I was a medical student. He was like the most incredible resident ever and, and taught me a ton. And, and so, um, so it's really wonderful to be here. And, and Eric, thank you for, for allowing me to come. So, so um, today I'll talk a little bit about, about treating dyslipidemia. In 2020, it's not such a a bold title. It's only three weeks predicting into the future, so I thought I would set a low threshold to vault over that. Um, here are my relevant disclosures. Okay, so um, so when you think about stands, which have only been around for for 40 years or so, and sort of the, the serendipity for their discovery um, was was by uh, Akira Endo who was working at uh, Sankyo uh, and thinking about antimicrobials and thinking, well, if fungi don't have cholesterol in their cell membrane, but other organisms do, maybe fungi might secrete something <coughs> that somehow interfere with, with cholesterol. And that could be a useful antimicrobial. Um, and so he then isolated the first statin, mevastatin, which didn't go to, to, um, to uh, the clinic, but it was a sort of a precursor of pravastatin. And then a few years later, then Merck uh, developed lovastatin and then simvastatin. And so the statins were shown to reduce uh, uh, levels of LDL cholesterol. But it was, it was Turje Peterson uh, from Norway who, in the uh, late 80s, <coughs> then approached Merck with the notion of doing a definitive trial to show the clinical benefit for statins and LDL cholesterol reduction. 
And, and he wisely said, let's start with the highest risk population. Let's take individuals who have a history of, of, of coronary heart disease, uh, who have very high levels of LDL cholesterol. And so in the 4S trial, you can see in the placebo arm, the LDL cholesterol was 190 milligrams per deciliter. I mean, to think back then to the equipoise that existed then, that you had people that had a heart attack, their LDL was 190, and people weren't sure if you should actually treat that or not. Uh, and so obviously, as we know, huge benefit in the 4S trial, reductions in MACE and in, in all-cause mortality. And then after that, then um, Dr. Brunwald and Frank Sachs at the Brigham and the School of Public Health asked an intriguing question about should we treat average levels of LDL cholesterol? The notion there is maybe average is not normal. Maybe this is different than a serum sodium, where normal is 140, and if you take any general population, the average is, is going to be 140. Um, but for LDL cholesterol, it's really a huge function of the diet and the society in, in which we live. And so maybe average isn't normal. An analogy might be thinking about smoking, dialing back to the 60s or so. And imagine if you were in some country where everyone smoked. Some people smoke one pack a day, and some people smoke two packs a day and three packs a day. Maybe average is two packs a day, but that wouldn't be normal. It would just be average for that group. So Dr. Bromwell and Frank Sachs then did the CARE trial, looked at pravastatin, and enrolled patients with average levels of LDL cholesterol, which in this case was around 130 or so, and showed that treating them with a statin reduced the risk of, of coronary heart disease and, and MI. You can see in the experimental arm, the pravastatin arm, the achieved level of LDL cholesterol is right around 100 milligrams per deciliter. And so, so after that came out, a few years later then, NCEP3, uh, uh, came out with their recommendation then for uh, patients with coronary heart disease to then target an LDL goal. So if we can remember those halcyon days when we had goals, have an LDL goal of, of, of less than 100. Still striking to think that for patients without risk factors, they're like, yeah, as long as you're 159, it's probably okay, right? In retrospect, probably crazy. But, but a goal then of less than 100. What else was sort of sorted out at that time was also, and we'll get back to this relationship, and this was work done by Colin Bajent and others for the cholesterol treatment trials collaboration based out of, out of Oxford, um, that this is a meta-regression of all the different statin trials at the time, um, and where each trial sits on this XY scatter plot for the x-axis is a function of the, the difference in LDL cholesterol between the experimental and the control arm. And where it sits on the y-axis was the observed relative risk reduction. And so if you put all these trials together and then generate a, a, a regression line weighting the trials appropriately, you can see that relationship that we've come to think about that for each millimole per liter, roughly 40 milligrams per deciliter, that we reduce LDL cholesterol, there's about a 21% reduction in major vascular uh, events. Fine. So that's where the field stood. Um, then the next trial was Prove It Timmy 22 that Chris Cannon and our group um, led. And this asked the question, uh, is lower better? So now not comparing statin to placebo, but now the new kid on the block, high intensity statin, the Torva statin 80, versus the established statin, Prava 40, which we had studied in CARE and, and other trials. And as you can see, uh, lower LDL cholesterol, more lowering, was better than standard therapy. You can see that in the uh, torvastatin arm, the achieved LDL cholesterol was a little bit under 70 milligrams per deciliter. And so the year after Prove It came out, then NCP3 then did an update that Scott Grundy led. Um, and this will be impossible to read, so we'll zoom in here. And what they then added was based on the results of Prove It as well as TNT trial, that now there was a new optional goal of less than 70. I think for many of us, that was the goal then we, we, we kept in our minds for high-risk patients with established coronary heart disease uh, to get their LDL cholesterol less than 70. So the next question is, okay, well, we've now studied statins. We've now studied high-intensity statins, showing it's better than moderate intensity. 
where do we go from there? So the next logical question is, is can we add a non-statin to a statin and make a difference? Um, and the best uh, drug available at that time was zetamide. I won't go into the background for zetamide, but, but it ultimately it was sorted out that it blocks cholesterol uptake in the intestine by blocking neiman pick type C1, L1 uh, protein in the jejunum. Okay, so, so then we did the, uh, and Chris Cannon uh, led this trial with Mike Blazing at Duke. It was a collaboration between Timmy and Duke, led the, the Improve It trial. And the notion here is taking patients who are like from Prove It, um, recently stabilized after an acute coronary syndrome, but we deliberately selected their LDL cholesterols so that the control arm, which would get statin alone, would achieve an LDL cholesterol of around 70, what we had achieved in the experimental arm of Prove It Timmy 22. And then in this trial, the experimental arm, which had a zetamibe added, would be lower still and be about 20, 25% lower, which is what the effect of zetamibe has on LDL cholesterol. Um, we got a lot of grief for this design uh, because people said, wait a minute, targeting people with low LDL cholesterols, you should instead target people whose LDL cholesterol is poorly controlled on statin, who have super high levels, and see if lowering them would make a difference. And our response to that is we didn't want to do the reprove it trial, right? We had just done prove it to me 22. And in that trial, 70 was better than 100. And so we wanted a twofer from improve it. We wanted to show that adding a non-statin to a statin would make a difference clinically. And two, we wanted to see if we could push down that lower limit and see if there was clinical benefit dropping LDL cholesterol below 70. Because the question is, if you think about the relationship between LDL cholesterol and outcomes, and if high LDL cholesterol leads to high outcomes, <coughs> as you lower it, it goes down. But is it a line or is it a hockey stick? Is there some point where there's an inflection? And maybe once you get down to 70, it doesn't make a difference. And lowering it to 60 or 50 won't change clinical outcomes. So we wanted a twofer from, from the trial. Uh, a large trial lasted a long time. Um, but ultimately achieved its primary uh, objective to show that adding azetamibe to a statin reduced cardiovascular events. Um, and you can see by design in the control arm, the simvastatin alone arm, the achieved LDL was around 70, which is just what we had achieved in the experimental arm of Prove It Timmy 22, just what the guidelines said we should target for individuals. And the azetamibe arm dropped it then down to, to the mid-50s. Now, of course, there was criticism saying, okay, it was significant, but you had like a gazillion patients in the trial, and you followed them for a median of six years, and the relative risk reduction is just 6.4%. That doesn't strike me as very big. But remember, the relationship we had seen earlier, that the clinical risk reduction is a function of the absolute decrease in LDL. And so, in fact, if we, now this is the same graph, now just colorized differently, but if we plot improve it, on this regression line, it falls exactly where you expect it to. So the reduction in clinical events was exactly what you'd expect for that amount of LDL cholesterol lowering. So that, that was very um, uh, congruent with the LDL uh, hypothesis. In fact, um, in our group, one of our, our fellows, Mike Silverman, um, then actually uh, did an analysis of all the different classes of LDL cholesterol lowering drugs. On the left, this is similar to the CTT analysis I've shown you. These are all the statin trials, except in this case, the editors in JAMA insisted that we do relative risk rather than relative risk reduction. So instead of the graph going up and to the right, it goes down and to the right. Anyway, so, but it's still, it's still, and there were many debates about that with them, but they were quite insistent on that directionality for reasons that still elude me. But anyway, so 23% reduction per million. So very similar to what we've seen for the, the meta regression of all the statin trials. But what about non-statin therapy? All right, and this was with diet, resins, ileal bypass, azetamibe. Again, generated regression line. Same relationship there, right? Around 20, 25% reduction per millimole per liter reduction in LDL cholesterol. So the notion here is um, for drugs that reduce LDL cholesterol, at least through drugs that ultimately work by causing upregulation of the LDL receptor and more clearance of LDL particles, um, that the risk reduction is similar. So it doesn't really make a difference what the drug is. It's just getting the LDL 
down. So then that brings us to PCSK9. So you know this is, is a fascinating story. It's rooted in genetics. And so Marianne Apapado and colleagues were looking at families who had the phenotype of familial hypercholesterolemia. So there were individuals who had very high levels of circulating uh, cholesterol in their blood. They had physical exam findings consistent with that, tendons, anthomas. And they had the clinical manifestations of hypercholesterolemia uh, in terms of heart events for coronary disease, MI, and stroke. And so uh, usually for that phenotype for FH, uh, it's due to mutations in the LDL receptor based on the work of Brown and Goldstein. Um, but this family didn't have mutations in the LDL receptor. And then the other locus that was known was ApoB. And they didn't have mutations in ApoB. So they had to figure out what was the locus driving this phenotype that looked like FH. And they eventually figured out it was mutations on chromosome 1 in a gene called PCSK9 that at that time no one had a clue as to what that had to do with cholesterol homeostasis. But that eventually was figured out. And the biology is, is, is uh, outlined here. So this is a hepatocyte. And the yellow spheres are LDL particles moving through the bloodstream. The rust-colored arms coming out from the surface of the hepatocyte is the LDL receptor. And so LDL will bind to its receptor. It will get internalized in the clathrin-coated pit there, come in. And at that point, there's, there's one of two fates. The LDL and the LDL receptor can stay together as it goes to the lysosome, where both will get degraded. Or the LDL receptor can dissociate from the LDL <coughs> particle. And when it dissociates, then it can recycle back to the surface of the hepatocyte and take more LDL out of the circulation. PCSK9 is the aquamarine uh, blob there being secreted by the hepatocyte. It binds to the LDL receptor and keeps it in such a configuration that it goes with the LDL to the lysosome to be destroyed. So it sort of chaperones the LDL receptor to its destruction, preventing recycling. And so it turns out that that family that, that Marianne Abifado and colleagues found actually had a gain-of-function mutation in PCSK9. So because of that, more LDL receptors were destroyed. So there were fewer of them on the surface of the liver. And so it couldn't clear out LDL particles. So there was higher circulating levels of LDL cholesterol and the phenotype of familial hypercholesterolemia. But then people reasoned, if that's the case for gain of function, wouldn't the converse be true? If you had loss of function mutations, that should lead to more recycling of the LDL receptor, more clearance of LDL particles out of the circulation, lower circulating levels of LDL cholesterol, and those individuals should be protected from cardiovascular disease. And that's exactly what Jonathan Cohen and Helen Hobbs at UT Southwestern found. And so uh, they found uh, several loss of function variants. On the left-hand side, you see histograms for the distribution of LDL cholesterol. The top one are the wild-type individuals. The bottom one are individuals who had a loss of function variant. And you see it shifted to the left. So they have lower levels of LDL cholesterol, not tremendously lower. 30, 40 milligrams per deciliter lower, but lower. On the right, though, you see the association then with coronary heart disease, 80% lower risk of having coronary heart disease. A huge clinical difference, a relatively modest difference in LDL cholesterol. Why? Because it's lifelong lower LDL cholesterol, a point I'll get back to uh, later on in the talk. And so that then um, made PCSK9 uh, appear to be a very attractive target to, uh, to interfere with. And so um, now there are a variety of techniques. The first I'll talk about is a monoclonal antibody. So this is a similar graphic. And the notion is you can now have a monoclonal antibody that could bind the PCSK9 protein and prevent it from binding to the LDL receptor and thereby allow that receptor to be recycled. And the LDL receptor can be recycled about 100 times, so there's a lot of efficiency in that system. To give us a little further confidence for this target, I also did a Mendelian randomization study, and I'll just spend one slide to orient people 
for those who are less familiar with this. The left-hand side has the bread and butter randomized control trial. You take a population, you randomize them by coin flip, by computer, to get an intervention or a control therapy. That intervention will cause some change in some risk factor. You're lowering LDL cholesterol, you're lowering blood pressure, what have you. And then you see how that affects outcomes. Mendelian randomization, sort of nature's randomized trial, where the randomization isn't by computer, it's by meiosis. And so individuals will, at random, inherit certain alleles from their mother and their father. And so some individuals will then inherit certain variants, and others will inherit other variants, and that will be at random. If you pick variants that affect the risk factor of interest, then you've, in essence, done a natural randomized trial that gives you um, stronger insights into causality than an observational study, where there could be many environmental factors and decisions that go into why people have higher low levels of uh, cholesterol. And then you compare outcomes. And so Brian Ferentz led uh, uh, this project that we did with over 100,000 individuals, over 14,000 events gathered through multiple studies. The notion from this slide is if you look at individuals who have genetically mediated lower LDL cholesterol, whether that's through the PCSK9 gene shown in blue, or whether it's through the HMG-CoA reductase gene, the target of statin shown in red, the lower risk of coronary disease is virtually identical in those cases, reinforcing the notion that it probably doesn't matter how you lower the LDL cholesterol as long as you do, and as long as it's through clearing particles out by upregulating the, the, the LDL receptor. Um, so it lines up perfectly, giving us further confidence that if we reduce LDL cholesterol through PCSK9 inhibition, we should achieve uh, a similar clinical benefits per unit reduction in LDL cholesterol. We then did the Fourier trial, actually for the dose ranging part to figure out what dose should be given. That was Laplace Timmy 57. Knihar was the fellow on for that trial and helped set the stage then for the definitive phase three outcomes trial. This was a large trial, over 27,000 uh, um, patients um, with established major ASCVD. They had a prior MI, prior stroke, symptomatic PAD. On the left, you can see the effect of PCSK9 inhibition, in this case, evolocumab, on LDL cholesterol, about a 60% reduction, quite steady over time. Look at the achieved levels of LDL cholesterol. A median of 30 milligrams per deciliter, interquartile range 19 to 46. So that means a quarter of the patients in the evolocumab arm or walking around with LDL cholesterols in the teens, in the teens. On the right-hand side, you see the effect on uh, outcomes, a broad quintuple primary endpoint, 15% reduction, 20% <coughs> reduction in CV death, MI, or stroke. To drill down to that key secondary endpoint, here show the cumulative incidence curves. And you can see that the curves are fairly overlapping for the first five to six months. I think that's another important concept when thinking about uh, cardiovascular outcomes trials for lipid-lowering drugs. And that, of course, stands uh, to reason um, that if we are going to give uh, a drug that lowers LDL cholesterol, and we were to start that today, we wouldn't expect the patient's risk of myocardial infarction to immediately be lower tomorrow. It's going to take time for that to kick in. In fact, the sequence would be that their LDL cholesterol would be lower over the week or so that it takes to reach steady state. Um, that should then lead to less uh, atho in the coronary arteries, but that takes months to years. That should then translate into a lower risk of myocardial infarction, and eventually that would translate into a lower risk of coronary heart death. In fact, that relationship and that timing has been seen in the statin trials. So this is data that Rory Collins published several years ago. This is pooling all the data from the statin trials. I'll draw your attention to the penultimate line there, all years of therapy with a risk ratio of 0 0.80, so about a 20% risk reduction per millimole per liter reduction in LDL cholesterol. We talked about that number earlier. But you then look in the rows above, and that's the different years that the patients were in the trial. And you can see it's not 20% for each year. Right? In fact, it's a blend. In the first year, there's only a 9% risk reduction. Then after that, there's a 22, 24, 28. 
In fact, it probably continues to grow, and we could talk later why it, it doesn't uh, obviously grow here, but that's due to how it's normalized for the LDL spread, which is only determined at year one. Take home from this is that, is that it takes time. The first year, there's only about half the benefit, and then it grows over time. Well, we then looked at the same thing in Fourier. So this is a landmark analysis now in Fourier, looking at CV death MI or stroke. In the first year, 16% reduction. Beyond the first year, 25% risk reduction. That probably more closely approximates what you'd see with lifelong therapy with PCSK9 inhibition in this population. The other big outcomes trial then was Odyssey outcomes. Uh, this came out one year later. Similar population, they were high risk, a little bit different. These are patients who had a history of an acute coronary syndrome from one to 12 months earlier. Um, also, a good LDL reduction down to the 40s. They had a back titration scheme. I won't go into detail for now, which is why the LDL curve for the allorocumab arm tends to drift up, um, but also a 15% uh, reduction in major adverse cardiovascular events. And for a trial that went longer, 4A was relatively short, a median follow-up of only 2.2 years. We had planned for it to be a four-year trial. There was intense pressure for the trial to get done early uh, from the sponsor for the trial, for payers wanting to see the outcomes data. And so the trial was upsized, the accrued events at a, at a faster clip than we thought. What we had planned to be a four-year trial wound up being about 2.2 years. Um, Odyssey outcomes went out to closer to three years. And so there, they were better positioned to see a reduction in fatal outcomes. And indeed, that they did for all-cause death. So that also is reassuring. The safety part for PCSK9 inhibition is really boring because there's not much to talk about. It's relatively straightforward. There really are no offsetting safety concerns. Um, no difference in allergic reactions, a slight imbalance in injection site reactions, about a half a percent over two years. The vast majority of those are, are mild. Um, and importantly, no difference in myalgias, cataracts, diabetes, neurocognitive adverse events, all things people worry about rightly or wrongly with statins and low LDL cholesterol. So that was very reassuring and very similar data for Odyssey outcomes. Again, no, no important imbalances. I want to share with you just two subgroups um, from, from Fourier, uh, but they're, they're to me the, the two most interesting. The first is looking at patients who had multivessel coronary disease or not. We asked a simple question when patients came into the trial uh, for those who had coronary disease. At the time they were coming into the trial, did they have known multivessel disease uh, defined just as uh, coronary artery stenosis of at least 40%. So we asked that they have that in at least two vessels. And so here you can see these side-by-side -side cumulative incidence curves. The left are the patients with multivessel disease, the right those without. Um, two points to take from this. First, not surprisingly, the event rate is higher if you just look at the blue curves, the placebo curves, for those who have multivessel disease. And of course that stands to reason coronary disease is a bad thing. So sure, their event rate is 12.6% over three years versus 8.9%, so almost 50% higher risk. But secondly, the relative risk reductions are different. 30% in those with multivessel disease, 11% of those without. And look at the shape of the curves. Right? For the multivessel disease, they're overlapping easily for the first year, and then a little bit of daylight starts to form and they widen out. Versus for those with disease, they start diverging early, right after six months. You can see wide divergence. I think biologically that makes sense, right? Because on the right-hand side, these are patients who don't have residual disease. By lowering their LDL cholesterol, you're preventing them from developing atherosclerosis, and that's good. So you eventually will prevent them from having myocardial infarction and stroke. But that's going to take time. The patients on the left are coming to you with a lot of athro. And so you can actually regress that athro so they can see the benefits much earlier. And so then if you do the multiplication of a bigger relative risk reduction by a higher baseline risk, that leads to a bigger absolute risk reduction, 3.4% versus 1.3%, and therefore a much smaller number needed to treat. This is the other subgroup. So, so we actually wound up enrolling 2,000 patients who had an LDL cholesterol less than 70 milligrams per deciliter. Median was 66 um, at, at the one-year uh, uh, mark. Um, now, if you saw someone in clinic who had a history, let's say, of myocardial infarction, and their LDL cholesterol was in the mid-60s, I think most of us would think, well, we're doing pretty well for them. It's not clear we really need to intensify their therapy. 
Certainly the U.S. guidelines would not call for any intensification. We've achieved our goal. It's not clear we can do anything to help their outcome, at least from the LDL cholesterol axis. But in 4A, those who were randomly allocated to evolocumab dropped their LDL to a median of 22. Again, look at that interquartile range. A quarter of them were walking around with LDL cholesterols of uh, under 12, many of them single digits. But the question was, would they enjoy the same clinical benefit? And already their LDL cholesterol is really low. Would they enjoy the same clinical benefit? And the answer is yes. And so these are two forest plots. The upper one is for the primary endpoint, the lower the key secondary endpoint. The diamond is the overall effect seen in the trial. The filled green squares are those patients who came in with an LDL cholesterol less than 70 milligrams per deciliter. And you can see they enjoy a similar, if not greater, benefit than other individuals, right? 30% reduction CV death, MI, or stroke. So can we actually clinically benefit those individuals? The answer is yes, we can and we should. In fact, this phenomenon is not just limited to, uh, to PCSK9 inhibition. These are data from multiple sources. The cholesterol treatment trials, collaboration for statins, improve it, Fourier subgroup I just showed you, the reveal trial we did with the CTP inhibitor, all these with populations whose average LDL cholesterol was at or below 70 milligrams per deciliter. The columns there are for events. So, so this here is over 11,000 events, huge amounts of statistical power. And then the right here are plotting what's the risk reduction per millimole per liter reduction in LDL cholesterol. It's that same 21%. Absolutely no attenuation. So it's quite, quite clear that there is continued benefit for lowering LDL cholesterol, even if you're starting <coughs> under 70. In fact, Bob Giuliano used Fourier as an observational cohort, taking the trial, taking individuals who, who uh, based on their LDL cholesterol at four weeks, so sort of where they settle out after they were randomized to evolocumab or placebo, and then plotting their achieved LDL cholesterol with their risk of CV death, MI, or stroke, adjusting for differences in, in clinical factors, because obviously now it's not randomized. It's an observational cohort, but no different than Framingham or any other cohort. And you can see here this monotonic, nearly linear relationship extending all the way down to the single digits for LDL cholesterol. The lower the level is, the lower the risk of major adverse cardiovascular events. What about safety? Doing the same analysis now here, just binning individuals here across 10 different safety outcomes, even those whose LDL was less than 20, absolutely no increase in safety events. So it's both effective and safe to lower LDL cholesterol to these very low levels. Now I want to go back to this curve here. Look at the shape of this curve. This curve actually looks very similar to other curves we've seen in the literature in the lipid field, including this curve. This is work from IVIS studies that Steve Nichols and Steve Nissen did doing intravascular ultrasound, looking at the burden of coronary plaque atheroma, looking at the volume. And this is a meta-analysis they did across multiple different trials here, um, looking at the relationship between achieved LDL cholesterol and then what happens to the plaque when they did baseline and then serial measurements. What's the change over time? And you can see that if someone's LDL cholesterol is north of 70, the plaque is growing when they did a follow-up measurement. At around 70 or so, it stays constant. As you get to under 70, you can actually regress the plaque. You can regress the plaque. Now, these were trials before PCSK9 inhibition, so there wasn't a lot of data. As we get down to the 60 and 50 range, the data starts to get sparse there. But then they did a follow-up analysis in a PCSK9 inhibitor trial, the GLAGOP trial with evolocumab. In this same line now, we see it extending even further down to the left. So the lower you get that LDL cholesterol, the more you're regressing a plaque. I'm not an imager, but, but the question you have to think is, you know, the patient in front of you, we think about primary and secondary prevention based on a history of, of MI, for example, or not. But in fact, you know, there are many patients who we know actually have athro that we just, we, we're not aware of it. So this was an interesting study that came out in Jack now it's a couple of years ago. Individuals who were in their, their mid-40s, so relatively young, they had no known cardiovascular disease. Blood pressure reasonably controlled, not a smoker, don't have diabetes. So that seems like a straight up primary prevention population where our targets for therapy are, are you know, much, much higher. But they did imaging um, uh, for these individuals, either with IVIS or with CAT. It's hard to read the legend below, but the first group are those whose LDLs are 130 or north of that. 
And here, if you have atherosclerosis, you're above the x-axis. Uh, if you don't, you're below. And so the majority of those individuals uh, with, with these demographics, but if their LDL is north of 130, they actually have coronary athro. What about 100 to 130? Still, right, it's around 40, 50% have athro. What about 70 to 100? Still, it's about a third of them have athro. It's only when you're really below 70 that those individuals don't have atherosclerosis. Again, that fits with the IVUS data. If you're north of 70, you're just building up atherosclerosis in your coronary <coughs> arteries and in other beds. If you're 70 or south of that, you're not. So um, to summarize the, L, the LDL part, and then I want to spend just a few minutes on, on two other brief topics. Um, where do we start? So high is bad. We learned that from 4S. Then we learn that average is not good, which I imagine is true both at Yale and at Harvard. Average is never good. Um, and then we learn that lower is better. And then with improve it, even lower is even better. And I think with Fourier and Reveal, which I didn't go into detail, and Odyssey outcomes, I think lowest for longest is best. And that's what we've deduced over a quarter century. Um, the guidelines, I have to say, is most guidelines remain uh, tethered to the past in some ways. Um, and so even our most recent US guidelines have thresholds of 70 before you would consider adding a non-statin. From my opinion, I think that is, is far too conservative. And we're doing a disservice to patients for that. We should lower them uh, even if they're under 70, especially in secondary prevention. Uh, I had the, the privilege of being the sole American on the ESC dyslipidemia guidelines. Um, but there, uh, the group took a more forward view with now a target of under 55. I'll say there in the text, actually, for those with recurrent events, the target was less than 40. O off the record, although this isn't really off the record, but off the record, the, the, the biology was all less than 40. And it was an issue of what you would put in a guideline that has implications for all the different countries as part of the EU meeting these targets. And as a guideline bo body, where do you set the bar for countries that have limited resources? Uh, and so there was a complex debate about that. But I'll say the science discussion was all l less than 40. Um, we're doing a couple other trials. Uh, one is the salia. So this is with evolocumab. This is now looking at individuals a rung below in risk. They have athro or they have diabetes, but they haven't had an MI or stroke. The notion is let's try to prevent the first event. And this is an ongoing trial now. And then the other uh, avenue we're pursuing now is with inclycerin. This is using RNA interference. So pictured up in the up, upper right-hand side are Craig Mello and Andy Fire, who got the Nobel Prize for deducing RNA interference in the C. elegans um, model. And so this on the graphic on the left shows that that works, that basically um, if you put in a double-stranded um, uh, RNA into a cell, in this case into a hepatocyte, there is machinery in that cell that exists that takes that double-stranded RNA. Um, the two strands are separated. Passenger strand is removed. You have this guide strand that's loaded onto the risk complex. And that can look for and bind to its complementary mRNA. And this is a way to the, and then that complementary mRNA is then degraded. And then that risk complex can cycle and find other ones. And so it's a way in cellular machinery to control transcription uh, or translation of the protein by, de by destroying the transcript. Um, and so this then became a way to harness that, that cellular machinery to interfere with the production of PCSK9 in this case. So rather than an antibody to block the secreted one, you just prevent the hepatocyte from synthesizing as much. And so the drug is in glycerin. Um, these are data uh, that actually one of our former fellows, Kosh Ray, published. Um, and so this here is looking at the effect of a 300 milligram dose, about a 50% reduction. Not quite the 60% of the monoclonal antibody, but 50% is pretty darn good. Um, and the real uh, attractive part for this is the frequency of dosing. After an initial dose and sort of a booster at 90 days, thereafter it's every six months. Whereas the PCSK9 monoclonal antibodies are every two weeks or monthly. So this has uh, obviously logistical attraction. Um, Recently in JAMA Cardiology, we published the, the one-year follow-up. I'll draw your attention to the orange uh, graph here, which is a 300 milligram dose, so data from Orion 1. Um, but this is after one dose. After one dose, you can see that the midpoint at 180 days 
is still about a 40% reduction. In fact, when you model it out, it turns out the area under the curve is about a 40% reduction. I'll get back to that idea of one injection, 40% reduction uh, later on. But we're in conjunction with Oxford now doing a Ryan 4. This is the definitive see the outcomes trial for infliserin. 15,000 patients, just like Fourier, prior MI, stroke, uh, PAD, <coughs> randomized to infliserin with the every six month dosing versus placebo, and the trial is, is, is well underway. I want to, in the remaining 10, 15 minutes, tackle two topics. One, to think more broadly about the, the lipid profile. These are, are data from Eric now from almost 20 years ago, um, illustrating what all of us carry around in our mind, the relationship between different measured lipid components and risk for coronary disease, and LDL cholesterol on the far left, a uh, positive association there, HDL cholesterol reverse association, higher levels associated with a lower risk of coronary disease, but also triglycerides associated with a higher risk. But of course, this association doesn't mean causation. And so genetics helps uh, uh, sort that out. And this is work that came out of St. Catherine's lab, um, looking at these different predictors, but now using genetics, not just what uh, in an observational cohort, the levels, but genetic variants and seeing the association of genetically determined LDL cholesterol, HDL cholesterol, and triglycerides with outcomes. The take home here is that for LDL cholesterol and triglycerides, strong association with coronary heart disease, nothing for HDL. So HDL is an excellent risk marker, but not a true risk factor, though reverse cholesterol transports a separate discussion. Um, and one could think about the magnitude of lipid lowering one would need to do, but for the sake of time, I won't get into that. Um, we also, so, so Brian Ferentz, Alberico Catapano, and myself and others did a, another Mendelian randomization <coughs> study trying to get at, at triglycerides a bit more. And we developed two different genetic risk scores. <coughs> One is using variants in lipoprotein lipase, which is responsible for, for hydrolyzing uh, 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 triglyceride-rich uh, uh, lipoproteins. Um, and then the other was in the LDL receptor, which would, of course, affect LDL levels. And so you could, based on genetic risk score, um, see what the difference in lipids were, and here in blue is, is based on variance in lipoprotein lipase, which is mostly going to change triglycerides. So a big difference, 70 milligrams per deciliter, and really nothing in LDL cholesterol. But we normalized this for a 10 milligram per deciliter difference in apolipoprotein B. And then for the genetic risk score for LDL cholesterol, we again normalized it for 10 milligrams per deciliter ApoB. Here, drop in LDL cholesterol and a trivial difference in triglycerides. So very different effects on triglycerides and LDL cholesterol. Same effects, though, normalized for the same amount of ApoB difference. Then the question is, so normalized, what's the difference in risk for coronary heart disease? And it lines up perfectly. So it really is simply the number of ApoB-containing particles. So if we think about the major lipoprotein classes, right, going back to medical school here, HDL, LDL, IDL, VLDL, chylomicron remnants, and chylomicrons. And we think about them and their, their constituents, a couple things. So first, we know HDL and LDL are mostly cholesterol rich. The IDL, the VLDL, the chylomicron remnants are really triglyceride rich. And those are the so-called <coughs> triglyceride rich lipoproteins. I think there's no doubt that VLDL, IDL, and VLDL particles are all atherogenic, the ApoB100 containing particles. Most people would also argue that the chylomicron remnants are also atherogenic. But what do we measure? We don't measure LDL or IDL or VLDL. What do we measure? We measure total cholesterol. We get that from our lab. We can subtract out the HDL cholesterol, so we get non-HDL cholesterol, although even though that's available to us, we don't actually think <laughs> about that number that often. Instead, we think about the LDL cholesterol, um, and typically with the Friedwald assay, most of that is then LDL and actually IDL, but we're ignoring, we're ignoring the VLDL particles, which you could either quantify by looking at the triglycerides in the blood, or by calculating the VLDL cholesterol, or using non-HDL cholesterol, which takes that into, into account. So this is another interesting story for genetics. I want to talk about familial hypobeta lipoproteinemia, rare genetic disorder. These individuals have low levels of LDL cholesterol and total cholesterol usually due to nonsense mutations in ApoB. Maybe they have a lower risk of coronary disease. They did tend to have hepatic steatosis. 
But they found some families that had this syndrome of low LDL cholesterol, but no mutations in ApoB, no hepatic steatosis. So the same phenotype, but clearly a different gene uh, driving that. And so it was quite interesting. So Kieran Musunuru, uh, working in, again in Sake's uh, lab, um, found this interesting family. Uh, and so the numbers are small, but I'll draw your attention to um, three individuals who happened to have low levels of triglyceride and low levels of LDL cholesterol. So that was interesting. Then by good fortune, individual seven in the first generation happened to marry someone who also had low levels of triglyceride and low levels of LDL cholesterol. And then through uh, great fortune, they were highly productive. <laughs> and so they had a very large family. Um, and so as might exist for um, what's an autosomal recessive disorder, then you can find individuals who are either homozygotes or compound heterozygotes. And several individuals were found. And then uh, for two of them, they did whole exome sequencing for those individuals, so looking at every base pair uh, in, in the exomes. Uh, and it turns out it's a gene, angiopoietin like 3, that was the cause of this phenotype. That gene plays a role here. So uh, here we have the liver secreting VLDL, right? VLDL, right, is a triglyceride-rich lipoprotein, and that's to bring triglycerides to the periphery, to muscle, to fat, uh, to, to adipose tissue, right? And that's an energy transfer, and that's what the liver does. Lipoprotein lipase then will be hydrolyzing those triglycerides there, and the VLDL particle becomes an IDL particle. Then hepatic lipase can work on it. You're left with LDL particles, which are a waste product of this, a waste product just to be cleared out by the liver. So lipoprotein lipase mm -hmm. works here. Angiopoietin like 3 is a break on lipoprotein lipase, as is actually APOC3. Um, so these are both breaks on LPL. So the notion then is can you derepress that? Can you derepress LPL and <coughs> take the break away and allow more hydrolysis? For the sake of time, I won't go into detail, but uh, rare individuals were found who then had loss of function variants and they had lower levels of triglycerides and lower levels of non-HDL cholesterol. And then in genetic analysis, they had much lower risk of coronary heart disease. So genetic validation of blocking <coughs> angioquatin like 3 should then lead to a reduction in events. And for the sake of time, I won't go through, but APOC3, similar story found. So now there are therapies being developed to target this portion of the lipid profile that we've tended to ignore. These are studies that came out a few years ago using an antisense oligonucleotide, a little bit different than small interfering RNA, but another way for uh, degrading mRNA transcripts, um, either against angiopoietin like 3 or APOC3, and somewhat different profiles. Recently at AHA, for those who attended, there were uh, reports of uh, siRNA against these same targets, again, with, with very good data. So then I want to finish in the last five minutes or so with the notion of what's the optimal physiologic LDL cholesterol. And really, it should be non-HDL cholesterol, but most of our data is with LDL, so it's easier to frame it that way. <clears throat> this was from a paper uh, that came out now more than uh, 30 years ago, where the authors said a level of LDL in the plasma of only 25 milligrams per deciliter should be fine. A really bold statement back then, really bold. Forest hadn't even come out then. So who would be so bold as to suggest getting LDL down to 25? That is actually Brown and Goldstein. This was in their Nobel Prize acceptance speech for figuring out receptor-mediated pathway for cholesterol homeostasis, or the LDL receptor. So I, I want to finish with this concept here of lifelong cholesterol burden. We think about this an analogous concept for smoking, pack years. You can do the same thing for LDL cholesterol. And Jay Horton, I think, was the first person to, to, to do this. And this is modified from his, his original work for that. Um, the notion here is someone has a certain LDL cholesterol <coughs> level. And uh, you look at, over time, the buildup of LDL. So let's say an average LDL cholesterol, 120 milligrams per deciliter. At 10 years, that's 1.2 grams per deciliter years. And at 20 years, it's 2.4 and so on. So this is just a simple uh, line, y equals mx plus b, uh, going up. The LDL levels obviously change during childhood, but for the sake of simplicity, we'll just keep it a straight line. That red line, the threshold for coronary heart disease, um, that can vary. 
right? That's when does the person start manifesting angina or an MI. And that will, of course, differ from person to person. Someone who is a smoker with uh, diabetes and hypertension uh, will manifest that earlier because they have other risk factors piling on. But if you have just picked an arbitrary level here of 8 grams per deciliter, but that means that in the 60s, someone would manifest, an average person would manifest coronary disease, and that sort of fits with our clinical intuition. Well, some people are genetically unlucky, right? Those with heterozygous FH, about 1 in 200, 1 in 250, and their LDL cholesterol levels are about twice as high. So their slope is twice as high. And so they develop disease in half the time. So in their early 30s, they would start manifesting coronary disease. And some people are really unlucky. Homozygous FH, quite, quite, quite rare. But they can develop coronary disease uh, you know, in, in, in their adolescent years. Some individuals are genetically lucky. We saw that earlier. Those who have a PCSK9 right, loss of function variant, they have lower levels of LDL cholesterol. And they're protected from coronary heart disease. Okay, well, those are natural genetic experiments. What can we do about reducing the lifelong cholesterol burden? Well, there's not much doubt to treat <coughs> patients with heterozygous FH early. That's well embraced by the medical community, and we treat people early because we know they're at high risk. What about for average people? Right? When do we treat them? Well, when we do our clinical trials, we need a certain event rate so the trial can be done in five, six years. We can get an answer in a reasonable time frame. And one way to enrich for risk is to get people who are older. The guidelines typically also focus on what someone's 10-year risk is. And we all know that the biggest driver for that equation, bigger than everything else, is age. If you're young, it's almost impossible to have a high enough 10-year risk to, to warrant therapy. Um, and so most of the trials and most of the time, we start thinking about giving a statin to someone maybe when they're in their 50s. And that's fine. And we're preventing events. And that's all good. But we wasted all this time when they're building up atro in their coronary arteries. At that point, it's very hard to shift the trajectory because so much time has been wasted. <coughs> so um, what else could we do? Now, this is a thought experiment. I'm not advocating this. This is just a thought experiment. But if one were to uh, uh, treat earlier, let's say in young adulthood, and what could we treat with easily? Ah, patients don't want to take a pill every day when they're young and healthy. I showed you earlier, though, PCSK9, an annual injection, an annual injection, right, gives you about a 40% reduction. So what happens if you did that, timed it with the flu shot, right? You get it once a year. But you started early, right? Then you have a much, much bigger effect because you're starting earlier. In fact, then, by this modeling, by this modeling, you would delay the onset of coronary disease by 28 years. This is just pure mathematical modeling from this, right? 40% reduction from an LDL to 120. <coughs> Let me share some data with you. This is a tale of two studies. So MESA, based here in the US, 6,000 individuals. LDL is typically 120. The Chimani Health and Life Project, um, based in the Amazon, not the Jeff Bezos Amazon, the Bolivian Amazon there. Right? Individuals living in a pre-industrial lifestyle, what are their LDL cholesterol levels? They typically run in the 70s, exactly the two different LDL levels I showed you. Well, they investigated coronary artery calcium. It's a surrogate for coronary disease, a non-invasive surrogate. What about in MESA? So you can see, as individuals <coughs> get older, right, more and more of the population starts building up coronary artery calcium. You'd like the level to be zero, certainly under 100, and you can see levels that are ginormous there. What about the Chimani, who have been, since birth, having LDL cholesterol levels only in the 70s? What does their profile look like? Like that, right? Virtually nothing. In that Lancet paper, they said they estimated Ironically, a 28-year lag is observed before the Chimani reach a CAC score of 100 or higher, sort of a threshold for disease that one might worry about. So um, just an example there that lifelong lower LDL cholesterol is important. And this is also work in another Mendelian randomization study that, that Brian Ferentz and I did, um, looking just at two risk factors that are well known to us, LDL cholesterol and systolic blood pressure. <coughs> this is genetically determined, but if you scale it, for individuals who lifelong have one millimole per liter lower LDL cholesterol and 10 millimeters of mercury lower systolic blood pressure, lifelong, 78% lower odds of coronary disease. So we know the levers to pull on. We're just not pulling on them early enough. So let me wrap up because we're close to the end of the hour. Um, 
just a couple points. So first, in established ASCVD, I think you can't get LDL cholesterol low enough, right? You've got to regress that plaque. Achieving LDL cholesterol levels less than 40 is effective and safe. You start with high intensity statin, you add azetamide. If you're not getting where you need to get, add a PCSK9 inhibitor, monoclonal antibodies for now, and hopefully siRNA will be another option in the future. Second point, in true primary prevention, true primary mm -hmm. prevention, I think you want to keep the LDL cholesterol less than 70. You don't want your patients to develop atherosclerosis. And I think the data is quite clear that if they remain at 70 or under, they won't develop it. So I think that's actually the most biologically uh, uh, um, sensible target. Third, we really should be mindful of all of the atherogenic lipoproteins. So either measuring ApoB, which we don't typically do, or non-HDL cholesterol, which is uh, available to all of us. Doesn't require fasting, just total cholesterol and HDL. And now new pathways for targeting VLDL particles are now being tested in phase two and then phase three um, trials. And lastly, I think the earlier we lower circulating levels of atherogenic lipoproteins, I think the bigger the clinical benefit for our patients. Thank you very much for your attention.